From the shores of its winding coastline to the ridges of the Sierra Nevada mountains, and from the deserts of the southern state to the pastures of the northern counties, no part of California has remained untouched by this drought. 2016 ushered this drought into its fifth consecutive year. Unprecedented. Scientists blame what they're calling a ridiculously resilient ridge of high pressure that's keeping conditions hot and dry. Most of California's 39 million residents are left wondering, when will it ever end? The state of California is resorting to drastic measures tonight to combat its severe drought. California has endured many droughts, but it's the one from 76-77 that many remember as the worst in recent history. My family and I run a, about a 2,200-acre operation out of Fireball, California. And as a result of the drought in 1977 and our water allotment being reduced by 75%, we were only permitted to farm 816 acres of our normal crop acreage. Governor Edmund G. Brown was in his first term when on March 4, 1977, he established a drought emergency task force. That summer was hot and bone dry. Water rationing began and agencies pushed strategies to save water. Most importantly, the public responded, doing its part to conserve. Everyone should try to do at least 20% conservation of their water use. Governor Brown's message now echoes that of 77. We're facing uh, perhaps the worst uh, drought that uh, California has ever seen since records uh, began uh, being kept about 100 years ago. But as you'll see, California is rewriting the playbook. It's redefining drought as a disaster and how the state communicates and responds. Now, if Mother Nature would just get on board and clear any uncertainty about her plans. What is the number one question that people ask you about the drought. How bad is it and what happens next? The last four years, it's pretty hard for us. Gotta save water. I cried because it was I felt alone. No community has felt the impact of five straight years of drought like East Porterville in Tulare County. But communities all over California are feeling the impacts in varying degrees and ways. Tens of millions of trees dead with millions more dying. Wildfires and less water to fight them. Fish kills, fallowed farmland and subsidence. Infrastructure is sinking. Municipal water districts struggling to provide service to their customers and private wells running on empty. And that brings us back to East Porterville, where officials estimate nearly 2,400 wells went dry by the third year. Vicki Orba is one of the several thousand here whose well water dried up. What am I going to do? I mean, what's going to happen? At 95, she's the oldest without running water in this area. It wasn't that long ago, her lawn looked beautiful. Did you ever think you'd see the day when you ran out of water? Never, because my dad said that as long as that dam was there, we would never want water. He was wrong. That dam formed Lake Success on the east side of town, which feeds the Thule River, although it's been a long time since it's been able to do that. The lake's level has dropped to record lows. The normal level is right near the edge of the upper boat launch parking lot. It's a stark reminder that the end of the drought is at the mercy of meteorology. The city of Porterville lies 70 miles southeast of Fresno in Tulare County. The Thule River runs through it and its neighboring town of East Porterville. East Porterville is older and more rural. There is no city water. Residents rely on their wells and most of the wells are fed by the Thule River. This is the Thule. Without the Thule flowing as it once did before the drought, wells withered. And without well water, residents face a very real survival crisis. Life here is no bed of roses. U.S. Census data show 72% of those who live here are Hispanic, mostly poor farm workers and their families. 
This is one of the most vulnerable communities in the state. By July 2014, East Porterville wells were going dry at a rapid pace. We've seen several thousand people um, adapting to life without water. Tulare County and California, for that matter, were facing a disaster the likes of which neither had seen. As the emergency services manager for Tulare County, Andrew Lockman came to realize this town was up a creek. There's really no plans that are written for a, an event that's still in response mode and still developing two, three, four years in. He says a drought isn't like your typical disaster, an earthquake or a wildfire. Not used to considering drought a disaster. No, not at all. A drought sneaks in, doing a lot of damage before anyone realizes they're in a full-blown disaster. Those worried about their own wells going dry had company. 1,400 people living in the city of Montague faced the possibility of their municipal water drying up. 500 miles north of Porterville, Montague stood on the precipice of disaster the summer of 2014. We have about another two months of water to, uh, to get the city through. Its reservoir, Lake Shastina, was at an all-time low. It barely had enough water to push the town's supply down its main canal. Little snowpack, along with hot days, all but evaporated their drinking water supply. The clock was ticking. Towns and cities in the Central Valley had that sinking feeling, because as agriculture pumped more and more groundwater out of desperation, subsidence creeped in. A close inspection of bridges around the Golden State reveal the telltale signs, cracks and crumbling concrete and asphalt. The ground is sinking and taking infrastructure with it, as much as two inches per month in some locations of the San Joaquin Valley. Of course, agriculture is especially vulnerable to drought. No water means no forage for livestock. Desperate ranchers responded. Many of the ranchers are completely liquidating their herds or drastically cutting back on the numbers of cows. A UC Davis report commissioned by Secretary Karen Ross shows the staggering impacts. From 2014 through 2015, the report shows that ag lost more than 15 million acre feet in surface water, leaving nearly 1 million acres of land unplanted, resulting in $5.1 billion in total production and job losses. The only thing hotter than the weather are the wildfires. There have been more of them, and they've burned in places, and at times, seasoned firefighters weren't used to seeing them. Cal Fire responded to 473 fires in January of 2014, and two in Humboldt County, one of the wettest places in California during the winter. Very dry vegetation feeding fire behavior. Extreme fire behavior. Like nothing many veteran firefighters have ever seen, time and time again. Very difficult to control in the initial stages. We got hot. We got roasted, broasted, and toasted. Less water also meant firefighters were challenged to find the wet stuff to put on the hot stuff. State fire chiefs said there were times when nearby ponds, lakes, or rivers were too shallow for helicopters to dip their buckets so they had to go farther to find it. Some firefighters didn't have enough water on board their trucks. Did the best stand that we could with the, the house behind us. Um, it, was a, it was a good save. Unfortunately, the uh, store and the restaurant next to us, we ran out of water. The drought dramatically increases the risk of wildfires in another way. Extreme conditions have weakened trees' defenses making them susceptible to the bark beetle. They reproduce in the inner bark of now unhealthy trees, killing them. While it's difficult to determine exact figures, a special tree mortality task force estimates the number of dead trees at more than 102 million, with the die-off continuing through 2017. Low river flows and higher temperatures are taking its toll on California's native fish. Experts say as many as 18 species, including most salmon and steelhead runs, are at risk of extinction if the drought continues. In 2011 alone, California lost more than 600 winter-run salmon. And that may just be the beginning. And from where I said, drought has amplified the risk of loss of biodiversity. California is known to have the most diverse biology and ecosystems in the country. But the drought is also killing them at the fastest rate of any state.
I didn't know coming in the door I'd be director in a period where we may lose some species because of an unprecedented drought. So I'm sad. By the fall of 2016, the people of Santa Barbara County watched their reservoir, Lake Kachuma, evaporate below a mere 7% of capacity. Docks have settled into dried mud and grass, and old Highway 150 and its bridge, normally under 50 feet of water, are exposed for the first time since the 1950s. 200,000 residents helplessly wait for their source of drinking water to dry completely by the end of the year. With hope fading that long-lasting dry conditions would give way to a wet winter, in December 2013, Governor Brown called on his emergency services director to immediately convene and chair a new interagency drought task force. In the letter, Governor Brown instructed them to meet weekly at the Capitol and review expected water allocations, our state of preparedness, and whether conditions warrant declaration of a statewide drought. We've come out of a couple of years of a lot of fires and a lot of other way, the Napa earthquake. OES routinely brings all these agencies together to be able to um, collectively solve problems and make sure the state's moving in the right direction. This was really no different. Everybody there was, in, to me, I was engaged. Um, they were there, you know, for California. The Drought Task Force essentially functioned as a water crisis think tank and action committee. More importantly, it got agencies that normally don't work together in the same room, talking to each other face to face and giving them a chance to educate one another about their own roles. All of my colleagues share with me this huge sense of responsibility and the weight of knowing that our decisions have real life impact. And by January 2014, they had the information they needed and sent their determinations to the governor. Today I'm declaring a drought emergency in the state of California. That declaration on January 17th, 2014, initiated a wide range of measures for the second severe drought to hit on his watch. The proclamation gave government expanded authority to take all necessary actions to respond to this historic drought. Among them, it gave water boards authority to set emergency urban water conservation standards, implement water rights and set water quality standards, determine how to accelerate the use of recycled water, protect cold water pools for salmon and steelhead, help people deal with emergency drinking water, protect water quality and water supply in the Delta, and it created a drought food assistance program that delivered about $52 million in food to people who lost jobs due to the drought. It's very powerful to have the governor talk about and designate that we are in a state of drought. We knew we were in a drought. We knew that we were having immediate impacts, but those impacts were going to get worse, and it was going to take a lot more work on our part, studies by our academics and uh, working with local government to get a good handle on the impact on something that was not just regionally based, but statewide. And so that, that day, that emergency proclamation, the announcement by the governor was very, very powerful in being able to set the course. That day, Governor Brown also began the conservation push, calling for voluntary water restrictions. Then, a month later, Governor Brown signed emergency drought legislation. Among many things, it provides $687 million to support drought relief, including money for housing and food for workers directly impacted by the drought, bond funds for projects to help local communities more efficiently capture and manage water, and funding for securing emergency drinking water supplies for drought-impacted communities. It also included $1 million for the Save Our Water public awareness campaign. It gave us the ability to go to the state board, uh, propose a, a rebalancing of environmental flows versus the amount of water that we would save in storage. Take some, take some, as much as you need. East Porterville's Donna Johnson was taking grassroots action on a local level. Early in the drought, her own well went dry Hi. and then discovered others were too. How are you? Many others. She told the city what she knew. And I said, it's very, very difficult for them. They give up because they think there's no hope. They don't have a chance. And I said, I think we have to go to them. And nobody said anything. So I put up my hand. I said, I volunteer. 
She's delivered hundreds of cases of water each week to those who couldn't afford it, in the beginning, paying for it herself. You took it on yourself? Well, nobody seemed interested. Meanwhile, back in Sacramento, the drought task force's job was not over. In fact, it was just beginning. It faced unique challenges all over the state, tribal concerns and jurisdictions, geographical differences, climate change, city versus county responsibilities, political differences, and society's belief that water will always be there. And what to do about East Porterville, drought's ground zero. The fact that the drought was declared early and the drought task force was formed and everybody was all hands on deck uh, made the beginning perhaps the most uh, fraught and we were making decisions that had never been made before on balancing decisions between uh, a host of horrible choices, balancing between agriculture, urban users, and fish and wildlife, which is um, really painful. The Department of Fish and Wildlife worried that endangered native species, like the Amargosa vole, of which only about 100 exist, would disappear if they misstepped or moved too slowly. What do you do? What's it like to literally be sitting in a judge or godlike role with a hundred animals potentially left. It's been very challenging for our professional staff. I think it shocked the conscience of many of them, this prospect of extinction being real and at our doorsteps for some of these species. What water was flowing from the north was more shallow, so it was warmer too. And that's not good for the fish that need it cooler to survive, like salmon and trout. So state officials spent $2 million to upgrade their outdated hatcheries by installing chillers to keep fish alive. Another project to help fish and the water supply was the emergency salinity barrier in the Delta. The California Department of Water Resources built the 750-foot-long rock wall in June of 2015 to keep the salt out. It essentially allowed us to, to save water upstream in our reservoirs that we otherwise would have had released to repel salinity out into the ocean uh, and gave us that buffer to use both for environmental purposes and for supporting cities and farms. It's a project that hadn't been done in decades and exemplifies the success of DWR's ability to manage state and federal projects through the toughest times of the drought. The lack of snow in the mountains directly impacted rivers' temperatures. The winter of 1415 did not go well. 21.6 inches of snow depth, four inches of water content, and that's 33% of its long-term average. And we actually lost water from the January measurement. We have less than one inch of water content. And as you can expect, that's, that's pretty grim. This is the first year in its uh, measurements going back to 1942 where this snow course has been bare, no snow at all. Snowpack fell to an all-time low. Snowpack runoff accounts for more than a third of California's water storage each year. We're in an historic drought and that demands unprecedented action. It's for that reason that I'm issuing an executive order mandating substantial water reduction across our state. Governor Brown's executive order signed that day was the first of its kind in California's history. 39 million Californians would be the critical key to conservation. As Californians, we have to pull together and save water in every way we can. The executive order directed the state's 3,000 urban water providers to cut their use by 25 percent, a savings that amounts to approximately 1.5 million acre-feet of water over the next nine months, or nearly as much water as in Lake Oroville at that time. So that meant the citizens of California had to cut big time. The order also replaced 50 million square feet of lawns throughout the state with drought-tolerant landscaping in partnership with local governments. It directed the creation of a temporary, statewide consumer rebate program to replace old appliances with more water and energy-efficient models. It required campuses, golf courses, cemeteries, and other large landscapes to make significant cuts in water use. And it prohibited new homes and developments from irrigating with potable water unless water-efficient drip irrigation systems are used, and a ban on watering of ornamental grass on public street medians. That order was issued April 1st, 2015. And there was a time that year, maybe four or six weeks after that, when it just flipped. The public just clearly got it, and they clearly 
switched to saving. Good thing, drought maps were turning redder by the week. The entire state was now considered to be enduring an exceptional drought. I never knew the term exceptional drought. John Laird, secretary of the California Natural Resources Agency, attended those drought task force meetings. He remembers how in the beginning, stakeholders argued they just couldn't cut or give up their water. They just didn't get the gravity of the situation. Folks, there's not the availability. We're in the middle of a crisis. To further understand what was going on around the state, the task force took to the streets with a listening tour. Throughout 2014 and 15, they made regular trips to areas of concern. One of them was Montague. Today's meeting in Montague is the fifth regional site visit that the drought task force has done around the state. Montague was in dire need of an alternative way to deliver domestic water to its people. This is the heart of the project right here. Here, Siskiyou County OES briefs the DTF leadership on the new pump project designed to fill that need. That pump is now fully installed and operational. It's state-of-the-art technology and remote controlled. 50 yards away, a new diversion pump pulls water from the Shasta River into this pipe and into the pump. From there, it's pushed up, over, and around two hills and travels about another, approximately another mile into the Montague uh, water treatment facility. It's a project that gives the city of Montague something it's never had, a contingency plan. The relentless nature of state and local uh, agencies coming forward and, and knowing that the process was gonna be long, it was potentially gonna be difficult and, and, and maybe there may be some bumps in the road, but working through those to to ultimately keep their eyes on the ultimate goal, which was getting this project done and getting water to the community in Montague. One of the things about that trip that was particularly good is that you saw a town that was in crisis and you saw people from the town, a local water agency, a local Indian tribe, and others come together to figure out how to use their different skills, money, authority, resources along with state and federal agencies coming up and figuring out how they could lend their support and we were able to solve a problem for a town where just a couple of months before uh, it was it, it seemed hopeless. Let's look at the brass tacks what we actually need to do. Cal OES Inland Region Administrator Eric Lamoureux along with OES executives and staff often met local state federal and private representatives in an ongoing effort to solve current drought problems as well as those coming down the pike. And come up with a plan and move forward with it because we got people that have been without water for over and going on two years. Assemblyman Devin Mathis heads this meeting in Porterville. The goal today is to develop concrete, executable solutions that will help the people of his district now and in the future. Drive through the cluster of neighborhoods that has lost its water, and you'll see the signs of drought on each and every home that's gone dry. You'll also see those 5,000 gallon water tanks. State and county OES coordinated the supply and delivery of those tanks as an immediate remedy to the dry wells. Installation doesn't take long. Another resident now has water. Thanks to God and thanks to City of Porterville and everybody in the United States are helping us with water. Without them, I don't think I could survive. Mary Lou Nichols' well water was brown, so she's become a cheerleader for the drought message. You gotta save water. The water you're saving, that's the one you're gonna need next year or a couple of months. So it's on to the next house, where Manuel Dominguez is waiting for his tank. I'm kinda young, 86 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not getting any younger. He's relieved to see his water tank going in. Whether it lasts four years, it's pretty hard for us. The undertaking is significant. Uh, we're making tremendous progress in getting bottled water out to everybody, working with our community partners, uh, while we continue to work on, on getting more and more tanks installed throughout the community. 
Cal OES facilitated the drilling of this new emergency well in East Porterville with DWR. It's providing a critical source of water to fill those hundreds of water tanks being installed throughout town. Cal OES Director Mark Gillarducci gains another perspective on ground, traveling through East Porterville and discussing the challenges and ideas to overcome them. And there is no better way to see just how vast the drought's effects have spread than from above. Cal OES Regional Response and Disaster Recovery Teams are supporting the Tulare County Office of Emergency Services and its community partners. Together, they're working to get water to those without it. We have been without water for about a year now. Many here say this man is doing God's work. Right here? Hi, Mija. How you doing? Haven't seen you in a while. On top of his day job and delivering Sunday and evening services, Pastor Roman Hernandez delivers water to anyone who comes for it seven days a week. They know that when you see a red truck at the church, the pastor is there, and so it's okay to stop for water. The water comes from Cal OES and County OES coordination, and it comes from strangers near and far, LA, Fresno, Missouri. Since November of 2014, they filled this container over and over and over again. I want to say at least 30 times. Just up the highway at a secure World War II era hangar in Tulare County, pallets upon pallets of water are stored and are about to be delivered. When they are, more will take their place. Families come to the pastor's church for shower water too. Wash stations give them a place to clean up and brush their teeth. Hygiene and health are at high risk during a drought. County and state OES coordination brought these mobile facilities to Pastor Hernandez parking lot in November of 2014. I don't know if you will mind coming here and if you have a one year. Huh? You don't have to pay, this is free. Also free? The water OES is providing the people of East Porterville at Fire Station 20. What do you use the water for? For the trees, yeah, yeah, for my yard, the trees. You have a lot of trees that you're afraid uh, might die. About ten, fifteen. Really? Uh -huh. What kind of trees? Uh, orange, uh, peaches, and so the fruit trees. Yeah, fruit trees. Uh -huh. Lee Perez and his family rely on the fruit his trees bear, so keeping them alive is critical to their own well-being. The drought is weighing heavy on everyone, from those suffering from it. Drinking water, thank God. We yeah. have, uh, we come like once a week. She just, you know, hopes that the uh, government you know, helps her, you know, to move. And she's, she's not doing it for herself, but the kids. No, get, to those helping the sufferers. Thank you. You're welcome, Juana. Bye. I, I don't know, you know, I just, I just pray to God every day, you know, that I'm able to get up again tomorrow and, and come here, you know, and do it again, you know. One big intangible that must be acknowledged in the overall effort is that Cal OES has finessed meetings between those who have political differences and a natural resistance to cooperation. I've been proud to, to watch our, our team members on our, on our regional response teams and recovery teams bring together those folks that don't want to be in the same room together and get them to, to, to find common ground so that at the end of the day we can help these residents. Thank you very much for coming out to really a watershed moment. All of the hard work paid off. A ceremonial burying of the first pipes to bring water to East Porterville. There's a lot of people with sweat on their brow on that one. <laughs> it took Cal OES and Governor's Office coordination, executive management participation, media pressure, city, county, and state efforts over two years to get to this day. A lot of people worked very hard to get to that point, um, to take advantage of infrastructure that was not so far away. <laughs> it's kind of a little frustrating that it's taking, you know, this collaborative effort to get to the spot with money where we could get this thing done. And he really appreciate everything you guys done for them. And not only for this family, for a lot of the families in the East Portalville, I want to thank you guys. It is a watershed moment. It is showing that community, the state, 
Trying to support local government has, has done everything they can to make sure water will start flowing. Finally, the big moment everyone has waited for. The first flow of clean, crystal clear, reliable water in three years for the Ramirez family. It's a new beginning and a huge relief for everyone in East Porterville and every person at every agency who worked tirelessly to make it happen. It's a huge win to, to see that. Well, we never expected to lead the broadcast with an attack by Godzilla. The summer of 2015, CBS News and multitudes of media reported on the development of a monster El Nino heading for California. Climatologist Bill Patzer. Over the next three months, this should turn into what I call a Godzilla event. Could this mean the drought's demise? Many hoped so. But the forecast of a super wet winter was met with cautious optimism. California needed a lot of rain, but over a long time period, not all in one winter, that would only cause massive flooding. The rain did come, reservoirs and rivers did rise, but ultimately, the winter of 1516 ended well below average. Godzilla never arrived on California's shores. The jet stream quit behaving as we expected it to do so, and instead of it just kind of staying flat a little further south, and sending storms kind of quickly through and hitting California on a regular basis, it developed a bit of a hitch and then the storm started going north. By that point, El Nino was already starting to fizzle and much of the rain missed California. Clouds of uncertainty still lingered. What will the winter of 1617 bring? Will there be a sixth year of drought? Will there be another round of mandatory cuts? If it turns out there's another four years, um, that's going to be deadly. Drought legislation signed in 2014 has helped put California in a better position to deal with what Mother Nature may have in store. State leadership has more of the tools it needs to mitigate the hazards of continuing drought conditions. Among them include changes in water policy, an increase in ag efficiency and water storage, and even desalination plant options. Desalination is the process of removing dissolved minerals from brackish or salt water to produce fresh, potable water. The state's water action plan says desalination can be a tool to improve water supply reliability and self-reliance at the regional and local levels, especially in times of drought. Several large seawater desalination facilities are being considered or under construction already along the California coastline to augment community water supplies. In September 2014, Governor Brown signed into state law the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, a first for California. The three-bill package calls for better local and regional management of groundwater use. The goal is to have a sustainable management of groundwater by the year 2042. We are definitely not out of trouble in California. California's reservoirs and groundwater is still at a deficit. 2.3 million acre feet in the hole for 2016. So even if the rains come back, experts say it's going to take more than one season to break the drought. The hope is that Californians have changed their behavior and won't write checks that their water banks can't cash. The drought gave us the opportunity to educate the public in a way that they decided to do things that they should have been doing anyway. Conservation will be the key. And um, it's not like, okay, we're done with the drought, now we can start using water again. The big push needs to continue to be conservation. Conservation matters, and it will continue to be the thing that makes sure that we have water into the future. State leaders and legislators themselves have educated each other and are looking beyond the now with every step they take. Every decision and every investment that we've made has been about the short-term mitigation, but thinking through how does that better prepare us for the future and to make sure that we're building our resiliency, that we're capturing these lessons learned, that when the next drought comes, we don't start from ground zero. The art of cooperation probably is, is the thing that's hardest to, to learn. 
whether it's surface or groundwater management, salinity control, reservoir levels, river flows, or any of the other numerous projects, DWR agrees that the goal is maximizing California's drought resiliency. We get a lot of attention on how we operate the state and federal projects, but those projects have a whole lot more flexibility. We can do a lot more good when they're operated uh, in close coordination with local water systems. The next set of drought managers to deal with uh, historic drought in California, I hope they can appreciate that that's really where the action is and, and from day one uh, trying to get that level of cooperation uh, is really important. Leaders are very aware of what history might say 10, 20, 40 years from now about the lessons learned and how they handled the worst drought on record. I hope that they look at our past droughts and see that the team of agencies under the direction of the governor's office they put together and worked together that they did an amazing job supporting the constituents of California and our natural resources um, in a way that was much better than the previous droughts. Despite all of the hard work, no government action can coax an arid atmosphere to bring relief. Indeed, Mother Nature changed course as California entered its sixth year of drought. So we had a storm barrel through on Tuesday. 2017 began with anything but dry weather. The rains came and then some. Sets of atmospheric rivers first ripped through Northern California, then Southern. Snow fell at record rates in the mountains, forming packs as deep as 20 feet. Will it all be the drought buster California needs it to be? Much to everyone's relief, it was. A merciful mother nature smiled down on California's thirsty terrain. Rivers flowed faster than they had in years. Reservoirs rose to long lost levels and water finally flowed through creaky weirs. We said it was coming, here it is. Turns out too much rain fell too fast, but it was also too late to help the more than 100 million trees that died during the drought. They in turn fueled bigger and hotter wildfires, which left land primed for massive mudslides. Oh, the whole mountain was sliding. Rivers and tributaries overflowed, choking young salmon before fish and wildlife rescued them. Some levees broke. Reservoirs reached capacity, while dams and spillways worked overtime. Some suffered expensive damage in the process. Overall damage and repair costs rose quickly, prompting a record-breaking five emergency federal disaster declarations in three months. Governor Brown officially declared the drought emergency over in most of California on April 7, 2017. But in his executive order, he said conservation must remain a way of life. The order lifts the drought emergency in all California counties except Fresno, Kings, Tulare, and Tuolumne, where emergency drinking water projects will continue to help address diminished groundwater supplies. Also, the Water Board shall adopt urban water use efficiency standards and rate structures and other pricing mechanisms that promote water conservation. And all state agencies shall increase efforts at building drought resiliency, evaluating lessons learned, and completing efforts to modernize our infrastructure for drought and water supply reliability. This drought is now in the history books, and the future is in our hands.